I'm going to tell you about recent progress in deep learning and uh, as it relates to AI and I think where I see some of the current limitations uh, suggesting path for the future towards creating human level AI. I'm not going to tell you about when some kind of magical event is going to happen because uh, I don't think it's reasonable to make these uh, predictions, but um, we can discuss it this afternoon. So uh, there's been uh, a lot of uh, breakthroughs uh, thanks to deep learning over the last few years. It started with speech recognition, uh, then some really big progress in computer vision. Uh, in both of these cases, we now have uh, benchmarks on which uh, trained systems do as well as humans. They're still worse than humans in many ways, but um, that's giving you a measure of uh, the progress that has happened. Recently, there's been pretty amazing progress in machine translation. I'll say a few words about that as an example of recent progress. Um, although it didn't really yet turn into industrial products, there's been pretty amazing progress in our ability with uh, neural nets to uh, move into the areas of reasoning, attention, and memory. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I think, interesting for the future because uh, neural nets had been thought for many uh, decades to be limited to things like pattern recognition, and now we're really moving into the kinds of things which more classical AI had been tackling over the last few decades. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of progress in, in reinforcement learning, uh, uh, playing games, Go, and so on. Uh, and what some of you maybe don't know is the progress that has been uh, recently in robotics and control. I think we're just seeing the beginning of that. Um, and uh, one area which isn't really an application, but uh, more um, something uh, underlying a lot of applications, which is uh, progress with recurrent nets and very deep nets, which allow us to better handle uh, sequential data and, and potentially handle uh, abstractions, as I'll mention at the end, uh, better. So uh, as, a, as an example for this uh, that I, I've chosen because we've worked on this uh, for a few years, uh, the use of attention and, uh, machine and its application to machine translation. So in uh, machine translation uh, with deep learning, one, one very basic idea that we've had for many years but by itself isn't enough is that we're going to be learning a uh, mapping from uh, text in some language to some kind of universal representation, which you can think of as the meaning of a sentence, and then we're going to decode that back into another language. The problem with that approach is that as the length of the sentences or the paragraphs grows, this doesn't make any sense. We have to compress, uh, say, a whole document into a fixed size vector. Uh, that's kind of crazy. That's not the way we, we do it. Um, if I translate a book, I am going to uh, sort of keep track of where I am in, in the source book as I translate more sentences in the uh, output book that I'm translating. And this is what attention uh, is used for here. We have a, a kind of soft pointer in the source of to where approximately I'm, I'm currently uh, doing my translation. Um, and that little idea, which is of course inspired by how humans do things, has been uh, having a big impact. Uh, for machine translation, but also in other areas um, like reasoning and memory and handling data structures with, with neural nets, which is one of the recently very active areas. Um, to uh, measure the effect of that, uh, it's interesting to look at a little bit of how things progress. So when we started working on machine translation about three years ago, our initial results were dismal, uh, much worse than the state of the art. Um, and we slowly, you know, slowly made progress. Eventually, we, we stumbled up upon this uh, soft attention thing, which really made a big difference. But, but even then, basically, we reached uh, the state of the art uh, of uh, previous techniques, uh, maybe be beating them on, on a few language pairs. But more recently, Google has brought that to the Google scale and, um, and obtained pretty amazing results. So this, these, these numbers are coming uh, from just a, a few weeks ago, um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and um, we, they, they now have systems trained on uh, data sets that are bigger than any one human can have a chance to see in their li lifetime. 
uh, but that, that essentially approach human level performance in terms of, uh, of machine translation as far as other humans looking at the translation are able to say. So uh, each of these columns, uh, is, this, is this working? Each of these, each of these columns um, corresponds to some score uh, given by humans looking at translation, the quality, and the PBMT is a traditional phrase-based machine translation. G and MT is Google Neural Machine Translation. And human is uh, oh, how humans rate other humans. And you see that we have, um, we have, uh, we've closed the gap quite a lot. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but still let you know that the, the promised breakthrough in machine translation that we were hoping a few, couple of years ago has happened. Um, all right, so now uh, let me say quickly a few words about why I believe that deep learning is working so well. Um, and for that, I, I want to step back a little bit uh, about you know, what I see as the ingredients for machine learning moving forward in terms of approaching AI. And uh, I, I see the following ingredients, at least, and probably more, but uh, as really basic for that purpose. So one is, uh, first, that you have to realize that in order to build an intelligent machine, that machine will need a lot of knowledge. And so the, the basic question of AI is, how do we get all that knowledge into the machine? And, uh, and in order to, to, to do that with machine learning, uh, that means that the, the, that knowledge is going to come mostly from data which means if there's gonna be a lot of knowledge, we need a lot of data, all right? That's, that's sort of very basic. And uh, you know, whether it's supervised learning or unsupervised or reinforcement, uh, you know, lots of knowledge equals lots and lots of data. The other thing is, of course, in order to capture all of that information, we need very, very flexible model, not the kind of uh, 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 simple parametric models that used to be very common, for example, in, in, in statistics. Um, and in many machine learning models. But that's not, uh, okay, so, so then the other thing is, uh, that goes with that is obviously to train those models that are gonna be big, uh, train a lot of data, we need enough computing power and uh, one of the reasons for the recent success, of course, is we've had GPUs and uh, I see this moving forward very fast in the next few years with the industry putting a lot of money in building specialized hardware for neural nets. Um, one little uh, other point that many people don't think much about is the, and it's one of the advantages of using neural nets in their current form, is that you can go from question to answer very quickly. So that's what we call computationally efficient inference. That's not necessarily true of, uh, of any machine learning approaches. In, in general, in fact, if you were to try to solve answer questions from uh, knowledge acquired from data, you would think that you need exponential computation to answer many questions. Uh, so essentially, these, these uh, methods use some kind of approximate uh, answering uh, systems that, that are very efficient, are trained, uh, and trained that way. But the most important point for uh, why deep learning is, is working so well is that it incorporates, that's the, my point number five, it incorporates uh, assumptions about the world that happen to be reasonable and work well for, for the kinds of tasks that we want to do with AI. And these assumptions, you can think of them as priors that help us defeat the curse of dimensionality to some extent. So let me elaborate on that a little bit. Um, the basic assumptions that uh, deep learning is making about the world is one of compositionality. Um, so you know, just as we use compositionality in understanding the world, in uh, engineering solutions to problems in uh, language, uh, we need to use this uh, idea that uh, we can both understand and, and, and answer questions about the world uh, by composing pieces together. Uh, that's uh, something that comes naturally in, in deep nets in two ways, in a kind of parallel way and in a sequential way. The parallel way is the idea of distributed representations, the fact that we're gonna represent percepts or uh, states of the world or thoughts uh, by a composition of features or attributes that are not mutually exclusive. Uh, that's the idea of feature learning that um, uh, I'm gonna explain a bit more in the next slide. And then of course the, the depth part, uh, the idea that these features are gonna be composed by uh, uh, the, the, the uh, existing, by, by uh, composing together features at lower levels uh, and we can do that at multiple levels of, of, uh, of a hierarchy. Um, that's a kind of sequential way of composing things. 
And, and both of these turn out to be useful. Um, so to understand a little bit the part about um, distributed representations and why this buys you a kind of exponential advantage statistically, uh, think about the problem of um, uh, analyzing images of people. And, uh, and, and let's assume that uh, we train a neural net that uh, at some level of representation extracts features, uh, attributes of those images. But of course, these attributes are not going to be predefined. They're going to be discovered by the machine. And uh, think about uh, as an example that maybe some unit is going to discover that uh, whether or not a person wears glasses, another one uh, the person is either male or female, another one that the person is a child, and so on. And it doesn't have to be those uh, clear semantic attributes, but you can think of them like, like that. Um, in general, if you think about all of the uh, configurations of these attributes, if you had, you had 100 attributes, each of them is, say, binary, you'd have 2 to 100 configurations of images that you'd like to characterize by these attributes. Uh, and there's not going to be enough training data to cover all of those cases. So the, 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 the magic here is that we're able to generalize from a small subset of these configurations to uh, new configurations. And the reason we're able to generalize uh, without having to look at all the configurations is that we can essentially learn about each of these attributes uh, without having to see all the values of the other attributes. So, uh, like detecting that a person wears glasses, you don't need to see all of the configurations of whether the person is male or female, or person is a child or not, or what's the color of their hair, what kind of dress they're, they're wearing, in order to figure out uh, you know, whether in the image we are seeing uh, glasses uh, uh, being worn. So that's true for many of these attributes. And that means that the number of parameters and the number of examples grows something like linear with a number of attributes, not uh, exponentially as if you were using more classical non-parametric methods that, that uh, people had been using like uh, kernel methods, which, which would in principle require an exponentially large number of, uh, of examples to, to cover all these cases. Okay, so, so that's all nice. Uh, but I think we're still very far from uh, human-level AI. Uh, I think the, uh, maybe there's too much uh, hype about AI these days, uh, as, as can be read in, in the press at least. And we underestimate some of the hard problems that are in front of us. That's what I believe. Um, so for one thing, all of the industrial successes we've seen are based on pure supervised learning for the most part. Um, and um, another uh, problem is that the, the way that our current uh, state-of-the-art systems generalize is still very, very simple-minded, I think, uh, that our current learning systems rely on superficial clues in, in the data um, that do not necessarily generalize well outside of training contexts. And that means we can easily fool those systems if, if, we, if we think about it. Uh, those systems really pick on surface regularities, like, like the color of things and, uh, and uh, dominant, uh, dominant uh, signals, like what's the, what's the background of the image. If, it's, it's, if there's a lot of greenery, then it, it's going to think that there's an animal, even though there really isn't. Um, so, so one thing I'll be arguing about uh, and that I'm pushing in my own research is uh, trying to think more about how we can uh, train agents to learn and discover high level abstractions. And that often is going to need uh, to think also about multiple time scales, uh, which is connected to this uh, idea of uh, learning long term dependencies um, that, that is, is dear to my heart. Um, Another technical thing is uh, we are still relying a lot on one very old recipe, which is uh, backprop uh, that requires smooth differentiable predictors, which isn't exactly what we need. And this is another topic of uh, current research. So uh, we need to do a lot better in terms of unsupervised learning. Humans are very good at unsupervised learning. For example, a two-year-old understands intuitive physics, even though her parents have never told her about Newton's, Newtonian's uh, uh, physics and differential equations. Um, and uh, we've had m many years of research on, on deep and supervised learning. Uh, uh, but, but all of the methods we have currently have some limitations. I'm not going to have the time to go into uh, all of these things. Um, in the case of Boston machines, it has to do with the, the, the problem of mixing between modes. 
uh, we, we've had a lot of success recently with autoregressive models, but I think uh, it's, it's not going to bring us to the next stage because these models don't learn uh, really abstract representations with, with latent variables. Uh, we've had lots of recent success with things like relational autoencoders and, and generative adversarial networks, GANs, and this is the current frontier, but they're kind of hard to train and still unsatisfactory in terms of uh, learning and discovering abstractions. But, but still, let me show you some of the uh, progress. This is the kind of sample we were getting uh, about uh, two years ago with, uh, with GANs. Uh, so good for digits, not so good for natural images. Uh, this is how it was uh, about a year ago. Um, and uh, these are still kind of, were specialized to one category. And, and this is how it is now. So this is generating images of volcanoes. These are not real images. These are generated by the computer. And it can generate any of the 1,000 uh, ImageNet categories. So this looks impressive, but uh, it's still very stupid in some ways. So what's missing? Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, I think a lot more research in making computer learning more autonomous and, and supervised learning is a crucial element of that. Uh, one thing I think we haven't really focused enough is uh, how to discover underlying causal factors. This isn't something that uh, machine learning is paying too much attention to. Uh, one, one thing that several of us believe is gonna be important but doesn't work yet is model-based reinforcement learning, which uh, with coupled with much more powerful unsupervised learning would allow us to um, deal better with completely new situations. So if you think about self-driving cars, there'll be uh, rarely observed but dangerous states that we have to deal with, and our current approaches are not gonna be able to generalize to these things. So we need to, to have systems that can imagine a future corresponding to states that are very far from the ones that it has seen during training, because these states could be very important for its, uh, um, in terms of uh, rewards. Uh, we'll need progress in computational power, but I think that's, that's going to happen in the next uh, few years and decades. Uh, we need to make progress in handling multiple time scales. Uh, there's going to be progress in, in understanding language, but I think at some point, if we don't make progress in our ability to discover and, and represent high-level abstractions, uh, we're going hit, to hit a wall there. Um, one thing uh, I want to mention is that we could very well have, if we wanted, uh, an AI which is passive, that uh, understands the world really well. I mean, it's gonna take some time before we get there, uh, but then that, that wouldn't have much significant influence in the world. Uh, however, of course, once we start having intelligent machines, we wanna use them not just to answer questions, but also to do things, to be active. And, and that, of course, raises interesting uh, questions um, about uh, the, the, the reward system. And uh, one question that I'm interested in is, uh, how do we learn human values? Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, how do we train a way wise AI? Um, so, yeah, I, I had a, a last bit, this is my last slide, uh, about um, using actions uh, acting in the world to guide representation learning. So this is a, a new idea that I, I've started working on uh, to try to tackle the question of what is a good representation and um, how do we go further in this direction that I, I, I've been pushing for many years of discovering and disentangling underlying uh, factors of, of, of uh, uh, explanatory factors that explain the data, uh, which is still too vague. And one idea is that if we have agents acting in the world, they can, um, they can act in such a way that uh, uh, they can control some of those factors. So, so the factors corresponding to things that can be controlled are obviously important causal elements of the world, and we could potentially use this to, to uh, disentangle some of the underlying explanations about the world. All right. So I'm gonna stop here and show you a picture of people in my lab and thank you very much. For those who don't know me, my name is uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber from the Swiss AI lab. And um, uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. I was wondering, um, you mentioned these long-term dependencies and examples like speech recognition and language translation. And at the heart of these current, current models, at least currently, there's always this long short-term memory for Google, which is making these predictions for speech recognition on your cell phones and for 
or uh, language translation. Uh, and, and these models um, can deal with pretty long uh, long term dependencies, sometimes even thousands of steps or even millions in certain isolated cases. So I was wondering, how far uh, do you think is, is it important to go back in time? And um, what is the main thing that is missing in the existing models? So um, it's true that uh, we're doing a lot better than we were doing in the early 90s in terms of uh, long-term dependencies. But in practice, we do see still, even using LSTMs and, and all of the techniques we currently have, uh, problems in which the long-term dependencies um, escape the, the, the learner. Uh, it, I, and I think one of the interesting uh, potential explanations for this is the training objectives that we are optimizing. So typically we optimize something like likelihood. And what happens with likelihood is that likelihood gives as much weight to all of the bits in the data. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of the really interesting bits are these uh, high-level abstract things. So if you think about speech, uh, raw acoustic speech, it has uh, lots and lots of bits that are detailed of the acoustics and very few bits that have to do with uh, the words and their meaning. And so when we do maximum likelihood, and, and these of course happen at the slow scale as well, right? So, so even though on simple toy problems, we can, we can do these things of you know, learning long-term dependencies. When we go to more realistic problems like dealing with language, uh, what we find is that the, the learners actually only capture fairly short-term dependencies and things get much, much worse if instead of working at the word level, you work at the acoustic level, which where the time scale is now 16,000 per second. So I think there's still a lot to do in, in that respect. And, and you are not optimistic that one can just um, uh, hope to solve that by getting another factor of 10 in terms of cheapness no. of computing power every no. five years, which means in 25 years you will have roughly a brain No, power no, power. because it's not a, I don't think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think there's just an overwhelming uh, effect here, uh, but yeah, I could be wrong. There's some, some of us uh, in academia have some concerns about how the, the relationship between us and industry and how that needs to <laughs> change. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um, I think there's been um, a lot of positive that has happened in that respect in the sense that uh, industry is doing a lot more basic research right now than it, than it used to in, in, in AI. Um, that being said, of course, there's a danger uh, of um, the, you know, the brightest people going to industry and not having enough teachers and research happening in academia. Um, I think this may be a temporary problem and uh, by the number of grad students that we're training and others are training uh, right now, I think in the next three to four years, hopefully we'll have enough uh, faculty for doing the job. Um, but yeah, it is a concern. I'm Tommaso Poggio. Um, you spoke about uh, compositionality. Yes. And I think we now have pretty rigorous theorems, uh, essentially um, demonstrating that the, the conjecture you had long ago is correct. And this brings up some interesting philosophical questions because the theorem says that deep networks can avoid the curse of dimensionality for certain classes of functions. Right. And Which is, the second function, part is often forgotten by some people. <laughs> and this uh, um, classical function are compositional functions. Right. It's like what the visual system does, neurons that look at local parts of the image, and then neurons that loco locally look at the output of the previous neurons from area to area, so that all computations are local. And, uh, and the question is, this is a debate with Max, Max Tegmark here. Yes. Uh, the fact that so many problems we deal with seems to be compositional. Is that because our brain works that way or is because <laughs> the physics of the world ah, looks that way? That's a really interesting question. I have thought a little bit about it. So here's what I think. I think our brain works that way. It uses those principles. And so we are able to solve those problems in the world that, that have those properties. And there may be other things that are escaping us because our brain isn't able to uh, deal with, the, with them. So my view, and I'll talk more about this in my talk tomorrow, is <clears throat> that the uh, neocortex is organized hierarchically. It's actually a hierarch 
hierarchy of sequential models, and the sequential models are not LSTMs. They don't deal with long-term dependencies. That's dealt with by the hierarchy. And that deals with compositionality and also deals with the sort of intricate interactions at, at different levels of abstraction. That we find that DNNs can do that incidentally to some extent, but uh, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing uh, where we can significantly outperform LSTMs in terms of this type of abstraction. Uh, but I, I think that ultimately, a lot of the problems we're seeing will be solved by uh, using a hierarchy of sequential models. So was there a question? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I, th I think I think uh, having uh, a hierarchy at in, diff in many different ways, so in space and time, in abstraction, all of these things uh, are important, and we've been pushing these boundaries for several years. And I think much more needs to be done still. Thanks. Okay, time for one more question. Okay, time for more, one more question. Apparently. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna give. The biggest surprise I saw in your talk was the little line at the bottom of one slide that said, maybe we need methods to learn ethics. Yes. Um, the reason I was surprised is I couldn't imagine what the objective would be. Since the next line on your slide was people don't agree on this. Can well, you elaborate? That's, that's a very good one. I wish I had the answer. Um, well, so, so one sort of easy solution is we could uh, maybe agree on a few wise men, <laughs> or women, <laughs> more likely. <laughs> um, the other is that we could look at consensus. In other words, the things on which many humans agree, I think, are more likely to be what we would like our wise AI to uh, follow in terms of uh, our values. But, but clearly, this require, is going to require a lot more thought. Shameless plug. This is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, how are we? One more question. One more question. <laughs> I'm so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with technology? <laughs> Hi, uh, Ramana Kumar. Perhaps a simple question. Um, one, the first factor that you said was important for the success of deep learning was um, lots and lots of data. Yes, yes. And I wanted to know whether... It's not just deep learning. It's any machine for, learning approach. Yeah, for yeah. all of machine learning. So I yeah, wanted to yeah. know if you foresee any bottleneck in generating data or whether this is basically solved by... like. Uh, are there problems where the generation of data will be a bottleneck or is that a solved problem? I, I'm not sure to totally understand the question. We have already lots of data. I think so it's I, being it's being generated by the by like people in the world, but it's also it can be generated by uh, machine learning systems right. themselves. And right, I don't know right. if there's when any we place get, we, when we get more and more agents acting in the world, of course, we're going to get a lot more of that kind of data. So uh, I'm not concerned about the existence of that data. And you know, we have a lot. We'll be generating more. It's more of our ability to take advantage of it right now, which is which is a bottleneck. Okay. Are we going to switch the speakers? It's your lucky day. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. <laughs> well, um, apropos the data question, I think uh, we want to develop intelligent machines. That's the engineering of intelligence. But we want to understand also human intelligence. That's yes. the science of intelligence. Yes. And, uh, you know, a child developing does not have as many, th You're probably right. have not seen until two years old, yeah. as many images there are in the ImageNet database, and certainly with labels. Uh, I'm not sure about that part, but, uh, but think about at least it. the diversity for sure, not. But certainly no labels. Yes, yes, yes. And so there is a lot we have to understand in terms of yes. the technology of unsupervised learning yes. or semi-supervised learning. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a great question. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm insisting a lot on our need to make progress in learning more abstract representations. Because, uh, and abstract representations that are good at modeling the world, at understanding the world, that's what allows the child to, uh, 
to take advantage of the little amount of data that she sees in her uh, you know, couple of uh, first few years uh, in order to generalize from very few labeled examples. Um, so of course, transfer learning, smith premise learning are pretty important in the research in, in deep learning, but we need to do a lot better than we're currently doing. There's some pretty exciting uh, new work going on in it's called learning to learn or meta learning, actually following some work that my brother and I did uh, 20 years ago, uh, where um, we, we, we are actually able to train systems to, to learn to learn from very few examples. And that's, I think, a very interesting path. All right. Thank you very much, Joshua.